Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty. I'm here with my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Courtney Staples. On today's episode, a patron, one Diplo Raptor, has some interesting mecha te- we're just gonna get right into it i guess so diplo you know who he is at this point if you've been listening to the podcast he's been giving us oh let's see uh blood cave sacrifice city was his last prompt or before that it was the death gates episode so long time patron uh much love to diplo raptor and this prompt is Feudal samurai lords battle with Magitech pagodas built on the back of brass and clockwork mecha animals. These pagodas range inside from towers to full-on forts. The tenets. There is one mecha animal so big it has a city built onto it. Number two. Magic is limited to empowering Magitech devices and summons. Magitech devices can include cannons that fire magic lasers. And number three. The setting is currently undergoing its own Meiji restoration and or entering its own Meiji period. So that is the prompt that we're dealing with today. I'm very excited to get into Zoid's world. Uh, But before we do that, remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com. Click on the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. If you want to follow us on social media, we'll be at Let's World Build over on Twitter. If you want to come join our Discord and come chat about Zoids, Pagodas, or the Meiji Restoration Era, you can do that by following a link in the description. Or if you're feeling particularly generous, like Diplo Raptor, or if you just want access to our sweet, sweet patron-only episodes, our patron-only Discord, and a bunch of other goodies, you can go to our Patreon donate money to us and we'll be eternally grateful with all the shilling out of the way let's get right into it courtney start us off what is the tenet that we're going with with our mecha pagoda samurai world start us off well first off i have to ask what are zoids Oh boy. <laughs> Zoids are an anime which is I'm pretty sure Diplo just took this idea and was like, yeah, I just want Zoids but like as a prompt and I'm like, okay, I can respect that. It's basically um they're giant robot animals that people ride into battle and it's an okay. anime. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Uh anime. thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right so anyway on to your tenant what is the first tenant you have for us Courtney all right um so mine relates to the period that the setting is coming out of uh so in the prompt Diplo Mm. says that they're currently undergoing like a Meiji restoration type thing and preceding that in real Japan was a period of isolationism Mm -hmm. so um to use one of Daniel's tactics of you know taking a trope or facet and like really ramping it up to the max to make it more fantastical uh i'm gonna say that in the setting that isolationism was literal like there was some kind of barrier that was formed around this part of the world centuries very interesting uh that shut off contact to the outside and only recently it started to break down and like i don't know what that barrier is or what the origin was but uh, it's there and it's starting to crumble finally Interesting. Ooh. So it's not like the cultural isolationism that was kind of uh, shattered by the coming of the black boats in Japan, but rather it's some physical barrier that they've constructed. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it could could have been something that they built. It could have been um, something that an external force placed around mm. them with like a, a god or a powerful sorcerer or mm-hmm. who knows any any number of things I very think. interesting yeah there's a bunch of interesting implications in that mm-hmm. as well it makes just wonder what they were keeping out yeah, yeah. or keeping in or keeping of in, course right. yeah right um insert rorschach.gif here <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So I love that already. I'm very interested in that. Um, yeah, I, I'm actually unsurprisingly, I'm very interested in the Meiji restoration aspect of this as well. And this is, this is actually the thing that my first tenet is kind of focused around for those of you who might not know what the Meiji restoration is. 
I would recommend Googling it and reading up on it because the summation that I'm about to give is going to be woefully misrepresentative of it. But for all intents and purposes, it's basically the abolishment of the samurai caste. Uh, so that means that the samurai in Japan were essentially um, de-emphasized is how I will put it. And mind you, that leads to a whole bunch of really cool and interesting like story hooks and uh, historical events that happen. But for what I want to focus on, right, is the Meiji restoration that we're focusing on in this particular setting has to do with the pagodas themselves. I like to imagine that the uh, the mecca that are being powered require a special cast of people and that cast of people is actually being um, decommissioned. So the people hmm. who were in charge of piloting these Pagoda Mecca, they have been de-emphasized and they're being, um, yeah, that, that that's what I'm going with. That I, I know that the whole deal is supposed to be like big old Mecca and stuff like that, but I actually think it's really interesting if we like use them as like, all, not background, but almost background type setting thing. Mm -hmm. what, what do y'all think about that? I like that. It makes me think yeah. of um, kind of a mech warrior setup. If the like, for example, like if the the cast of the the clans of the mech warriors had been like decommissioned, and then now the clans like have to figure out what to do with their lives, right? And mm -hmm. and that's kind of the story that I'm more interested in in kind of playing with is like, what do you do with a warrior cast once they've been like once their purpose has been removed, right? And and then, of course, what are you going to do with all those mecha? Like, you got all this mecha lying around, you know, like, you, there's no one to pilot them. So what are you going to do with them? Mm -hmm. And those are the stories that I'm really interesting in talking about. I feel like I have to drop my second ton in now. I know I just went, but it ties in, like, so much to what you're talking about. Um, Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, mine was... Basically, like the the idea of pagodas got me thinking about the religious connection to Buddhism and Shinto. And to carry up through that like religious spiritual vibe, I had wanted the pagodas and shrines on the backs of these mecca to be home to spirits, which are also essentially the pilots and power sources of the mecca. Okay, so so the spirits themselves are the ones that are the pilots. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like they're they're ultimately the ones that are in control of what the the mecha are doing. Interesting. That's very interesting. Okay, so when you say that the spirits are the pilots, right? Mm. Are they human spirits who are like maybe it's like a, a warrior who's come back, or is it like more like a like a shikigami or something like that, where it's like a spirit from the afterworld that might not be human at all. And so like the best you can do to pilot these things is to like kind of steer it in a yeah. vague direction of some kind. I had left it pretty open in my tenant that it could be like a, an ancestral, like human spirit kind of thing or mm. more nature based or more like magical. But then your tenant has me wondering, like, are they now performing ceremonies that are sort of, cleansing these spirits and sending them along is that why these sort of pilots are becoming mm. no more in the setting i mean alternatively we can make it so like the spirits are just part of the everyday setting mm -hmm. you know like yeah. now we have spirits who are walking around in like their regular citizens which i think might be more interesting that is kind of cool yeah can you speak to um in the meiji restoration how empire factors in uh sure what do you mean um so what limited understanding i have is that um it's a restoration of like imperial reign and an emperor so i would just yes. like to understand that in relationship to what was happening in the rest of the world because sure. some of my tenants yeah. involved that yeah absolutely so during that time period japan was essentially ruled by a shogunate which was uh, a military leader uh there was always an emperor who played more of a religious role but the Meiji Restoration saw the abolishment of the shogunate and the restoration of the emperor as the head of state for Japan. Okay. Um, so, again, still kind of a figurehead, but still religiously very important. Uh, so, like a unification, basically, under this emperor. It, yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so imagine that... Um, 
So the queen just died, right? Mm. Uh, she's a figurehead. And imagine that parliament, instead of being like a, a group of, you know, like politicians, they're a group of generals. They were a group of military leaders. Right. And they were the actual backbone of the political system. Mm -hmm. So that has now been abolished. And then the, the uh, royalty is now basically taken over Taking as – Exactly, exactly, exactly. And and is it fair to say, too, that part of this is a response to being outclassed by other forces beyond their realm? That that is certainly part of it. OK, um, because because so yeah. that would be useful here, too. Like if, if maybe mm -hmm. part of the isolation has to do with whatever they're fighting against has taken precedence requiring this restoration. I, I had some questions about that as well. Yeah. But Daniel, you haven't given us a single tenant. So why don't you go back to back and hit us with your tenants? Well, I was asking those questions because I wanted to speak to the emperor. Uh, um, of course. And yeah. so now there's a mention of the animals being clockwork constructed. Um, and mm -hmm. there's, you know, like it's everything is, is very mecha driven. Let's see. So the, the, the pagodas are built on the top of these mecha animals. Um, and so I want to extend the mechanists. Um, and I think the emperor is a fully mecha being. Ooh. Interesting. Hmm. So, so there's no flesh on this emperor. It is purely mm -hmm. a clockwork being. Yes. And people don't like that, I think. Okay. Mm. I would like to remove any kind of anthropomorphism with this emperor. I would yes, like I it agree. to be a full Human. ass machine or like. Yeah. Like I, by that I mean oh, like he's when, like totally a machine, completely like not human a machine. At all. So like yeah. it, it like doesn't resemble anything mm -hmm. that is either humanoid or an animal in any way. Like it's either a tree or a clock or something that is like massive and like a work of art. Maybe can we twist that so like Absolutely. the public thinks he's a person, but he is totally not even human. He's totally a machine. Yes, like there's a, I, there's yeah. a mythology yeah. of the emperor being a man. Or whatever he is, but he's not at all. <laughs> yeah, right. I like that a lot. We okay. can we can even do something like uh, no one ever sees the emperor, but yes. there is the voice exactly. of the emperor. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. so it's like that is Love the that. the person who speaks for the emperor. But in reality, right, no one's ever seen the emperor, 500%. and that's because it's a giant clockwork wall. You I know? love it. Yeah, almost like the oracle in ancient Greece that, yeah. like you could hear supposedly, but mm -hmm. never see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That, I love it. All right. So so that's your first tenet is that the the emperor is a giant clockwork being. I like that a lot. <laughs> what you got what you got? Hit us with the second one, Daniel. What do you got for us? Um, my second one is an extension of that. And I was trying to think culturally what's happening. Um, and that is people can be partly clockworked. Okay. In general. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And that is also creating a rift during this restoration. Like perhaps these the previous samurai or whatever that are being decommissioned the warrior cast like are not at all tainted by that but mm -hmm. the modern trend is to maybe incorporate this clockwork aspect uh, to oneself okay. well if if the samurai cast are spirits as courtney kind of suggested then oh, it's yeah. because they physically cannot interact they don't want, with yeah, the machinery it right mm -hmm. i mean like the movie maybe corrupts it, it too yeah yeah. Oh, actually, that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, maybe the pagodas weren't always mechanized. I, I like to think that they weren't, but they've become mm -hmm. mechanized over the yeah. time. Yeah, mm -hmm. because of that, because of and the emperor's representation of this movement. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's what I got. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, okay. My second tenet is uh, kind of lame because it's actually a negative. Uh, in that I don't want there to be any kaiju in this setting. That is, that okay. is my tenet. I don't want kaiju because it's so easy and obvious and like right there Fair. that I, I like, I'm like, let's, let's try and do something else. And I'm glad that no one else had a kaiju based thing, but moving forward, I just don't want kaiju in this world. What so, do we do with a prompt? I'm sorry. Hmm? There is one mecha animal so big. It has a city built onto it. Oh, it's still oh. a mecha animal, though. Not like a... It's just an a animal. Okay. Natural yeah, it's... Well, no, creature. it's a mecha. It's not a kaiju. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Kaiju are like cre fully biological creatures. Got it. I didn't realize that was a requirement for these beasts. <laughs> what do you... What do you mean? <laughs> I didn't know they had to be flesh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that like that's what... Like, otherwise, it's mecha. 
Like that's the delineation is that Kaiju hate anime so much. I don't have any of those facts in my head. <laughs> 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 We're kill Rob. Rob is like sick. We're gonna kill him. Don't, don't die. Don't yeah, die. don't die in the pod. Actually, die on the podcast. Yeah. We might get better ratings. Oh, that that's would, true. That would really yeah. most use you. Yeah. Well, oh your my god. You know. Yeah. Uh, an entire tear is shed for the tabletop role playing game industry when I die on podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, question: Is it like kaiju were never a thing ever, or they could have once been a thing and now are no more? Well, now you've just answered that question <laughs> in that they've never, ever, ever been a thing ever. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. That's, I, I think that's kind of fun. They're being banned and made a narratively, it sounds yes, like. Yes. Okay, okay, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I find, I feel like the scope in the story so far, if we're centering it on these, um, this lost cast of people, and there are large things at work, like we have the, the you do have these giant moving pagodas. And we do have like a larger than life emperor. It seems like mm -hmm. the story zooms in to these individuals. Yeah, I'm actually really interested in kind of fleshing out the whole uh, cast of spirits a little bit more. Because the fact that they're spirits and that they're people living amongst like flesh and blood is really interesting to me. And I think that that's something that we should definitely explore a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. There seems to also be a sense of reordering the world. At least that's what I'm, I'm feeling so far. Um, in the sense that, like, there was an order to the world, at least in these casts. And, mm -hmm. you know, clockwork suggests precision and obviously modernity, but it, it also suggests a reordering of things. And a rest, the restoration is literally a reordering of things. So it makes me, well, the themes mm -hmm. seem to be there to work with. Yeah, especially if there's, like, outside influences now starting to leak in because the barrier wall thing is crumbling now. Yeah. I think that's where we want to go next is to figure mm -hmm. out what that wall is, how it works, who put it there. And we kind of go from there. I think that answering those questions is a strong start. Yeah, I, I was very indecisive in what could have caused it. I was thinking like, Shock. I know, I know. <laughs> Terribly surprising. Um, could have been a wizard that erected some magical barrier or like a god that made a geological formation. Um, or something that this area, this country built long ago. Well, why don't we tie it in to the spirits in some mm -hmm. way? I think that's kind of an interesting way to approach it. Uh, rather than be like a physical barrier, maybe it's a spiritual barrier of some kind. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, like there, so there gives reason to the spirits playing a more active role. You know, like, we, because again, we're really focusing on the spirits, I think, a little bit. And I think that's interesting and a good place to start. Yeah. What if it was something had created this barrier that blocked spirits from leaving this area? Mm. So that's why they're all like forced to stay in. And that's why they became part of the, the pagodas and the Mecca and everything. And maybe even like around the barrier, which I am picturing as like a dome over this region. There's just like a clusters of spirits everywhere in the atmosphere okay i love this i love this and i want to expand on this because i have an interesting idea i think so the barrier has now been unsealed right mm -hmm. and whereas the spirits before were kind of forced to um stay around this area and live their lives or unlives now there's actually a choice to, so so you can choose to stay or you can choose to pass on. And maybe this is what's happening is that the uh, the decommissioning of the Mecca and stuff like that isn't necessarily by choice or rather isn't necessarily forced upon them, but they finally have the choice to move on. And yeah. so more and more Mecca are kind of becoming unpiloted because it's like, yeah, no, we want to you know move on with the next phase of our afterlife. And so – what I think is even more interesting then is the people, the spirits who decide to stay mm -hmm. because their story is a lot more interesting, I think. Yeah. Like what's making them stay, um, what's keeping them in place. And it also right. creates this implication of like, are there going to be people who voluntarily give their lives to become spirits to pilot these like mm -hmm. now sort of derelict Mecca? That's yeah. And that, Ooh, that now you're <laughs> introducing some really dark 
implications here as well. I swear I didn't want to include any blood sacrifice. It just happens. <laughs> I don't know. It it just it just happens. I don't believe you, <laughs> Courtney. <laughs> um but yeah, I think I think that we should probably explore the uh changing relationship between the spirits and the human world Mm -hmm. because i think that if we explore that relationship and like i i I don't know i think that that's where we find a really core and interesting and unique aspect to the setting what do you think daniel yeah i want to i'm trying to understand i want to nail down what we've just come up with so i understand it better um fully like, it seems like this barrier is spiritual. It's meant to keep in these spiritual things, the power, the pagodas, right? That's fair to say. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was placed there perhaps with good intentions. And I imagine. Maybe. Um, or, or, so that, that's, that's up for debate. That we don't know if it was good yeah. or bad mm-hmm. intentions. I'm What it seems to me is like maybe it was placed there with good intentions for the people, but it's bad intentions for the spirits because they're kind of bound to the space. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wonder then there must be something that has that is from the center going outward that keeps them in this culture, right? Mm -hmm. Passing on to the next life. So maybe there is some object or thing or person. Maybe it is the emperor and being Mm -hmm. transformed. Now Mm -hmm. he can't keep them there anymore. I don't know. Um, So I'm wondering what is the thing that fixes them there? What do you mean by fix fixes? The, oh, you mean like physically like keeps them there, right? Yeah, because I wonder because there's a barrier, right? On the exterior mm-hmm. that's prevent that separates where they can go from where they are, right? But maybe that barrier is projected it outward, like it's a bubble. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, okay, yeah. So could there be something that projects this bubble rather than just being kind of a static historical thing that's sitting there? Right. So you, you need to figure out a little bit more about that spiritual barrier before we can continue on is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I want to get a sense of like, why was it constructed and how does it persist? We don't need to answer specifically, but just like mm-hmm. in terms of themes. Maybe yeah. we uh, maybe we create a danger or conflict with its creation yes. because it sounds mm-hmm. like this barrier existing is not a good thing for the people, right? Like it forces mm. isolationism for them. Right? Yeah. It seems like over time it may have been bad, right? Like maybe they, maybe right. they kept the spirits to animate the pagodas to protect themselves in some way. Mm. Maybe yeah. this is some kind of an extra planar attack. So there is like an attack from the spirit world mm-hmm. and this gap or this gouge in reality into hell is like now spilling out and it's a and it's a corrupted infection that it like the 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 country is an epicenter and then around that is a spiritual bubble and what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to like suck the lost spirits into hell to kind of fuel some kind of army but what ended up happening is they figured out a way to use those spirits to power the pagodas instead or something like that I don't know. I'm I'm tossing ideas out here. I'm mm-hmm. fully open to different ideas. I was almost picturing the opposite where like the gouge or like the source of the invasion or what have you is like outside of this region. And that's why yeah. they constructed the barrier. Mm-hmm. And um, basically like on the one hand, guaranteeing that they would survive on the other, leaving every other nation around mm-hmm. them to fend for themselves, which uh, in turn may have further fueled the invasion by you know all that death and everything so they don't even know what's on the other side of that like it's let's let's give it an arbitrary number of years right let's say it's been 60 years and they don't know what the world looks like because they're like oh there is a demon war on no we're not going to take part of that and then bubble up and then now the walls are down they're like they don't know what the rest of the world looks like anymore i mean there's there's two things i'd like to keep in or i like to put in play like one i think i think because the spirits we're dealing with have a very human kind of feel to them especially being pilots and having a a sense of loss Mm -hmm. it would be nice if we make this exterior threat also human in some way like it's not some extra spiritual force it's it's maybe another nation or something like that Uh, and the two i think we need to like figure out what it is like like because i'm trying to think back to the major restoration right and 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 you can like elaborate on what that was happening historically but it's it was a fear that part of it was it was a reaction to a fear that they were outclassed right in the world it wasn't a fear so much as it was a reality a a reality yeah so (laughs) so that's what i mean like they're outclassed and they need to unify and strengthen and, and adopt technology from outside and so right 
it would be if if the external threat is human, it'll let us tell more human stories with the spirits. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think like an event in the past that set this all up and it was good at the time, like maybe like you guys are saying, like it bubbled them off and protected them for a time, Mm -hmm. but things have changed. And now that spiritual protection isn't enough. And, And the political class realizes that. What if it was like a necromancer who was basically using dead spirits that came into his region to create more soldiers for himself? So by mm. like Does sectioning. It evil, hmm? <laughs> Does it well, have to be evil though? Does it have to be evil though? See, see, here's the thing. I'm actually um I'm actually less inclined to have it be a necromancer, mm-hmm. but huh. I think that you highlight an important point. And if you go and look at the tenets again their magic in this particular setting is restricted, right? It's basically used to summon and it's basically used to empower. So maybe that's what we focus on, like, because they have technology, they have crazy technology, uh, but their magic is fairly limited. So maybe this threat is magical in nature. Mm -hmm. Maybe the empire is a magic empire or something like that, that has magic that they just cannot deal with. They, they just can't understand it because they don't have that level of understanding of magic yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. I didn't mean to um, cut you off, Courtney. So I wanted to let oh, you no, finish no. what you were saying. I just, I just was like, can we make him less evil? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I was just like trying to figure out uh-huh. a threat that would cause them to isolate themselves to that level, to like that extreme. Oh, so you, and I'll get back to what Rob just said, but you, you were, so you mean this, this necromancer is a bad thing that he, he may have become from within, but he's bad and they, they were just trying to stop him. Or like, I was picturing it as an external threat that oh, had started okay. to amass this enormous amount of power. And that's why they decided to just shut themselves off entirely. Well, then maybe that can connect to what Rob was saying about yeah, yeah. their, in the, the current, the place in the past being a magical empire, if that's the external threat. I, I would uh, I would also like to do something different, like than the typical necromancer threat. Mm-hmm. So if we could like focus on a different type of magic, mm-hmm. and right. I because I, I think that'd be really fun, you know, because the the necromancer like enemy empire is fairly well known at this point. So maybe if we have like oh well they're actually geomancers or mm-hmm. oh they're pyromancers, you know, like yeah, a type yeah. of yeah. a type of magic user that we're not used to seeing as much. Could it be the source of the clockwork power originally? Like maybe their empire wasn't the codas weren't clockwork to begin with. Expand on that. So like right now we've been assuming because of the way the prompt is structured that in the past they had clockwork animals, clockwork pagodas, and it was always part of their culture. And we, and we have the spirits controlling them. But maybe the, the pagodas weren't clockwork to begin with. They were something else, and the spirits control them in, in that sense. And this necromancer is who introduced, he, maybe he's an artificer. He introduced like clockwork technology, which vastly outpaced whatever they had. And um, the adoption of that clockwork technology to keep up with him is what eventually made things mechanized with mm-hmm. the pagodas and separated the feudal lords from them. Oh, so the external world would be like very steampunk style. Uh huh. I see. And so the, the, I would say then that this realm is becoming more mechanized, and that's it's a reaction to the world becoming mechanized, but it's at odds with the spirit. So it's we're kind of inverse here, where mm-hmm. the nation that we're focusing on is the necromancer nation, essentially, right? Yeah, but, sort of. Yeah, because they're the ones who who keep the spirits bound in order to right. see, protect I themselves. Right. <laughs> but I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call them necromancers. By the way, they're yeah. probably like spiritualists or something like that. Yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. Less, yeah. Spirit channelers, even if we wanted to go that route, mm-hmm. but like channelers or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, okay, I, I'm just trying to pin down what is this nation good at let's start there yeah. because we have a bunch of clockwork stuff which if the emperor is clockwork that to me suggests that they're either in line with the clockwork empire that's kind of i, I just feel like there's some dissonance that mm. we need to resolve here yeah. first mm-hmm. i have a feeling that um the setting so if in if to mirror the meiji kind of or the, the pre-meiji setup right Politicians were warriors, right? And the the politics of this land realizes that to survive the external threat, we can know we need to adopt their technology. I imagine they constructed this emperor and a mythology around him um, to start mechanizing things. 
And so he's kind of like the tool that the political class uses to start the process of incorporating this magitech. Whereas in the past, maybe these pagodas were actually just cool looking mythical animals that have some ethereal nature to them. And they've encased them now in mechanized armor. You know what I mean? Like they've added the technology on. So the difference between the two nations is that this nation has a spirit behind the tech, whereas the other nation is literally London clockwork. They don't have any spiritual magic. They're just they're just machines on their side. Can I offer another idea that we don't necessarily have to go with, but like Please, another yeah, kind of way to flip things was like, if this nation that we're focusing on heavily is very mechanized and and everything, but the external uh, forces that they are so afraid of are much more naturalist and kind of rely on overgrowth to overtake things. And that is why these pagoda mecha animals are constantly on the move because they there's a risk if you ever stand still that you'll be like sort of trapped down to the earth forever by this external force that's causing the land to just grow rapidly if that makes sense that's quite interesting actually so almost like flipping how you normally have nature as the good and yeah industry is bad this is sort of the yeah, industry word. is normally the invasive force, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But in this case, it's actually uh, like an overgrowth of vegetation and like plants and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's kind of interesting because now we have a druid villain, which I'm actually kind of interested <laughs> in. Mm. Can we make a connection then? The one thing I think is missing is um, connecting the two forces in the current setting to that. So, for example, there's a spiritual force, there's a mechanical force. Mm -hmm. Um, so then are, is the spiritual force connected to nature and the villain? Mm -hmm. I guess that could be related to why they put this barrier up. If he was, if the villain figure was using the spirit energy to fuel the overgrowth in some way. Um, okay. So if we, if we, if we played that out, right, just talking through it, mm -hmm. um, at some point in the past, does that mean in the past they were always mechanized, like pre-restoration, when they were feudal lords. I figured like the feudal lord stuff is when the mechanization happened in a large part, because that's when their isolation began, basically. So the restoration then is about getting rid of your technology. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. that's that's why I was suggesting is that the animal, the, the mecha are being decommissioned. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that's so part taking, of the restoration. Taking the armor off and then the animal underneath, the spiritual creature is, re is revealed. Oh, that's a cool idea. The inversion, yeah. right? So, yeah. so that That's some, actually quite interesting. Yeah. So maybe the warrior class in the past, um, in order to survive whatever event happened in the past, they put on the armor. They mm -hmm. adopted the technology. Maybe they they have their own alchemist or whatever that forged this stuff, Magitech, whatever scientists. And it's the directly restoration, from the emperor. It's directly yeah. from the emperor. Yeah. Okay. And and so and now so does that mean the emperor, the mechanized emperor, he's from the past, basically? Yes. I feel okay. like he's been in power for like for centuries at this point. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So it's an inversion. So then so then as the spiritual barrier does that, that means that the spiritual barrier must be there to keep the spirits in the machines, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they can be powered. So right? they can basically be controlled by human uh -huh. forces. So then that, what that suggests to me then is in order to achieve this restoration, which must be a secret thing, it's not sanctioned by the emperor. It's kind of like a, a, a restoration by the people in a sense, um, is that mm -hmm. they have to come to terms with whatever external power, you know, comes from that other nation that's all nature based. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it suggests then a return to some time before the emperor's reign, when the spirits were free and the earth was natural, right? Well, I mean, if we're if we're using history as like kind of a guide here, then the time period where the spirit barrier went up is when the emperor lost control of the empire and like a, a military force took control. Uh -huh. So okay, so that gotcha. means that maybe the return of the emperor, maybe the emperor left and put themselves in this barrier. And that's where you see this rise of this warrior class. And now that the emperor is back and mechanization is a thing, like, I don't know. I think that there's something interesting there that we can play with. I just, I think we can simplify it. Like, it seems like there's a distant past at the end of the distant past. There wasn't machines, right? 
some threat occurs, they mechanize, mm -hmm. and then there's a long period where they're mechanized, maybe dominant, and then the threat changes, and now they need to go back to the way they were, right? That mm -hmm. seems to be the gist <laughs> overall. Yeah, and maybe with the Emperor as part of the barrier, like, that's allowing him to see what's happening on the outside world. Mm -hmm. He has that view and he can tell mm -hmm. like, okay, things are becoming safe for us now to start opening up again. And that's why the barrier is mm -hmm. crumbling because it's an active decision by him. Can we say that the emperor is forced back into a clockwork body and doesn't really like the fact that it's clockwork? Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. So maybe yeah. he was a divine like, person originally, like, like the spirits. Right. So that's why I'm thinking like, oh, the last emperor sacrificed themselves to create a spirit barrier. Mm -hmm. But over time, that barrier is deteriorated. And now they're able to reincarnate into a clockwork device. Right. So the emperor's back. You know, the, mm -hmm. the fabled emperor is back. Um, but they're pissed off because they're kind of <laughs> stuck in a, in a mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if the mechanism is like – the giant pagoda on the back of that one, like city-sized oh, yeah. mecha animal. I like that. Like that's the representation of the emperor. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so they're just a building, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you speak to the emperor, you go in the, in the building and speak to like this totem or something. Oh, mm -hmm. it's like yeah. the forbidden palace, you know, like where it's like yeah. no one is allowed in the forbidden palace, but the palace itself is the exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can get behind that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we just need, I guess, in the, to figure to it's moving forward, we need to figure out what is the situation of this oppositional force, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. How fucked is this empire that the barrier is down is the question that I'd like to answer. The external one, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling the external empire is in some way related to, derived from, or a version of the current one. How do you figure? I feel like there's no need to expand this, the, the boundaries of the story to incorporate an entire separate culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the history of, you know, oh. Japan or Asia in, in general is, is large enough that you can have um, two sections of the same country and become the whole story. So this is a civil war then. Mm -hmm. That might make more sense. Yeah. That, yeah. I think that by, by keeping that scope a bit smaller, I think that mm -hmm. actually does help because yeah. now you're talking about, you know, like the soul, like trying to find the soul of a nation. Yeah. You know? And that and families, to me, I think, yeah. yeah. Dynasties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That works, Daniel. And, and yeah. then this way there doesn't have to be some kind of power escalation. It's like mm -hmm. much smaller than that. And more is at stake, like a culture is at stake. You know? Right. Yeah. And and that's always more fun because it's not like they're going to get wiped off the map. It's their way of life that gets changed. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we took a while to get there, but things are finally <laughs> starting to come together. And good work. I feel like good work on Courtney's part in forcing that inversion, because at first Agreed. I'm like, well, how could that work? But then I ha when I was talking through it, I'm like, OK, now I can see it. And sometimes I think like when we're doing world building, we have to force ourselves to just try an inversion to see what happens, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, do we, what other questions do we have about this setting? I just, I feel like the more historical tidbits you give us, the better. Cause every tidbit you've gave us has really helped extend it, you know, further. Mm -hmm. So as we go, I encourage and would welcome more tidbits. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Well, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about the Meiji Restoration period is what happens to the samurai who have been stripped of their power and rank. And uh, there are a bunch of rebellions and there are a bunch of attempts to restore the shogunate. And so there is an internal clash between the forces of the ex-shogunate and the power of or the forces of the emperor. And. What I think would be really interesting is this idea that neither power base has truly has has really solidified yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we focus our setting on something that things could still go either way, right? Because if we're now focusing on a civil war, a cultural war, having it so we still don't know the future of this country yet. I think that's where we're going to find a lot of intrigue and a lot of interesting um, concepts to run with. 
Yeah, I, I love that because it puts us in the middle of the action. Like a lot of times the yeah. story is like XYZ has already happened and there's all this backstory and now we're starting and it's like the interesting stuff happened before in the past. You know? <laughs> right. And I think what happens is, you know, the spirits who have been pilots of this these mecha, they're like, well, you want us to pass on, but we're not ready to go yet. I still mm. feel like we have lives to live, even though we are literal spirits, you know, like. And then that in and of itself, this idea that the spirits are conscious living beings that still want a life to live, even though they don't have a physical form. I think that's something that we should probably explore a bit more just because like, I, I don't know, like I I picture this, uh, this, I picture walking down a city street in this world and you're seeing spirits walking next to vendors who are, you know, selling candles and food next to, you know, kids playing hoop. And then maybe there's a ghost kid along with them, you know, like the idea that you're blending the spiritual and the physical world. Uh, I I'm really intrigued by that. And I think that that's something we should focus on. I feel like I need to go rewatch spirited away to get some inspiration there on that. Mm. front. The only thing I would want to modify is can the spirits not be literally ghosts but can they be um in more of a like i don't know east asian sense they are spirits but they take on material forms that are different in some way so they're not yeah, like, like a yokai or a shikigami or something like yeah that. like something yeah. like that that way they have some physicality to them and the person you know you can interact with the one and they have a physicality they can be killed just like a person they just happen to be spirits like okay incarnations mm -hmm. you know I'm down with that. How do we make them unique? How do we what, like we need rules for them and I want to nail those down. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, are they similar to the animals? I feel like the animals yeah. in case in the armor are big versions of them. That's what I was thinking too. Mm. Like if they're just sort of smaller versions of those animals. So they're living suits of armor? Or like whatever's underneath the armor. R right, that's what I mean is that there's a spiritual force that inhabits yeah. a suit of armor. They're literal ghosts in exactly. the machine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They've been plated and the pagodas are on their backs. Okay. Um, I find that to be unsatisfying, uh, but I feel like we're very close. What? What's the unsatisfying part? For I feel like the living armor thing has been done before, and I think that we owe these spiritual things to be, I, I think that they could be cooler. I think that they could be like a little bit more unique than just walking around as as armor, you know. So let's let's start with that then. Yeah. Well, I think that we had kind of discussed that the armor is like a newer thing that was mm -hmm. put, like newer in the scheme of history, but that was put on these spirit animals as more protection or more defense against the external right. threat. So like underneath that, there's still like a a form of something, whether it's like animalish or kind of demonish or what have you. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like they're literal like suits of armor walking around. Yeah, I pictured more like they're inside of a clockwork machine, basically. Mm -hmm. And right, it, and, and that to me is unsatisfying because I don't want clockwork people walking around because I feel like that's been done so many times before that like we owe we owe them something more interesting. I think. Well, do you mean the? the individual people walking around the culture or the, the big animals? Cause we're just talking about the animals being encased in the car. Oh, I'm talking, I'm talking about the spiritual people who were once the pilots of these pagoda mechs. Oh, okay. We're just, we're just talking, I think Courtney and I are talking yeah. about the big war machines. No, I'm not. So, yeah. I'm talking okay. about yeah, yeah. the people. So then no, we're so not the people, arguing. So, yeah, right. We're arguing, <laughs> we're arguing completely different things. Yeah. So yeah. the people would be like the unarmored, like smaller yeah. versions of the sort of, spiritual animal exactly. creatures right so what do they they're not look in like? armor yeah right yeah what do they look like because i don't want mecha people walk. i don't want yeah, like yeah. clockwork people oh, yeah, yeah. no we, we weren't saying that's that, yeah. not what we're saying yeah, yeah 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 just gotta clarify yeah I, I mean i think that the regular people like i don't know my my mind in visually just thinking about it right now i'm, I'm seeing some kind of anthropomorphic people because in a lot of asian folklore kind of things you have like fox people and mm -hmm. other kind of weird animal things Right. I, hmm. What do you got for me, Courtney? What do you got? Um, I guess carrying on the idea of like the 
the animals that have stuff built up on them and what if like there are tribes or clans based around animals and whatever the dead people stem from is like that's their kind of form that they take on so if you have like the fox clan the spirit people are maybe they're like literal little foxes running around or they could be fox type people okay so this is this is my question and this is kind of where i'm like wary a bit so Mm. do you want furry anthropomorphic foxes running around Mm. see yeah exactly i wasn't picturing them as like furry people right like because otherwise like so these pilots who have been piloting the mecca right the the cast that they have been that they have been like spurned and like de-emphasized they're just literal foxes but they're spirit foxes i mean i'm i'm not opposed to i i personally don't like animal characters but mm-hmm. if right. it can if it works in a setting i'm okay with it and i think um I, i'm okay with them being anthropomorphic humans um but they don't have to be the same like, yeah yeah some could be foxes i think Maybe these are like, I'm thinking like, um, you know, like the Bollywood Indian movies where there's like people that are somewhat animals, like they're slightly different. Like it could be like that. Like the spiritual mm-hmm. effect is that it's brought in the, the folklore creatures into their their physiology, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. of these particular people. Yeah. See, like. I, I know, know that, that you don't like that aesthetically, but yeah. I think that could work for the setting aesthetically because I could I could visualize it. I mean, I, right, but I can just as easily visualize like literal spirits, like literal ghosts walking around. And aesthetically, I think that's more interesting and more pleasing, you know, because I like, just don't it, know how that works physically, though. Like, right. And that's why it's interesting to me. I that's why, like, yeah. that prospect, like the idea that you have you have to jibe the spiritual and the physical. Like, I know it's difficult. That's why I'm interested. It makes in less it. sense. Because these guys are in machines and they have to have all these inner lives and stuff. I just, I see too much of a separation between the rest of the people in there and, and, and them. You know what I mean? Isn't that the point though? Isn't that like, that's, that's kind of thematically what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, they were once revered by this culture and now that their role has been de-emphasized, they're now struggling to find substantiality within this culture that has de-emphasized them. That is the, in, that's the thematically, that's what I'm interested in exploring. Wait, so you are okay with them just being ghosts? Yeah. I, I know Daniel was the one who was oh, not. Okay. Yeah. I think had a they, problem with them being ghosts. I have the problem with them being ghosts because I just don't see how their insubstantial nature lends itself to, I mean, I get like what you're saying thematically, but I just don't, I can't visualize like ghost people piloting clockwork machines and then, you know, wandering around as Ronin and like grappling with other people. Like it just, it seems like an unnecessary aesthetic choice rather than, I I don't get it basically is what I'm saying. As far as like piloting, I was kind of picturing that they would like sort of just meld into the machine. Mm -hmm. Like they aren't like sitting in a cockpit, like with a console in front of them. Like they're actually, Mm -hmm. they kind of sort of ectoplasm like they just into a little bit. Yeah, yeah, into like the machine and into the the spirit animal as well. I mean, I'm okay with them doing that, like to interface, but I think on a day to day basis, it's just it would be too strange to me to have like interactions with these ghost people. I'm going to sit and have tea with a person, mm-hmm. or th- it, this lack of physicality almost. Like, could they perhaps like take on that form when necessary? But on a day to day basis, they have more physicality to them. Because I feel like if we're going to go weird, right, we might as well make them very weird and like not even human looking. Well, see, I feel like I feel like insubstantial ghosts are pretty fucking weird. You know, like yeah. I don't think that we need to go gonzo with it. But I, mean, I if, think that if you like, guys are in it, on it, I'll go along with it. I just don't like it. Well, we maybe we can maybe we can square both of our kind of ideas here, Daniel. You know, mm. like what what do you want out of them? You know, like what, what about them having a human form that is a spirit is like not working for you? I think what is appealing to me about this setting is that the, there's a genealogy involved. It would, it seems like there's, um, when I'm trying to think of the setting, I'm thinking of like people have a cultural history and they're very, it's a very physical history and part of the physicality has some connections to this clockwork stuff, right? Cause it's very mechanical. And 
I just, I feel like when they're ghosts, I can, I'm picturing like people walking around streets and there's ghosts and it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, how do they interface with this culture? They would seem so separate and alien from the culture. I don't really get how, how you can follow a story of like a party of four ghosts, you know? <laughs> and then how did the humans deal with this? Like, how does that work with like, food or i don't know housing or mm. um it just it makes it raises a lot of questions for me that i feel like are necessary see that that to me is the thing that i find very interesting about the mm. setting like i i think that we're gonna have to find a way to agree to disagree and then like or, or like completely change something where this this role is de-emphasized right mm. because the whole crux of this idea is that these people are the cast that are being de-emphasized and are being mm -hmm. isolated in culturally and, you know, like because of the, ch the changes that have occurred. Right. So maybe that's what we need to do is we need to square that concept. And originally Courtney said that they were just spirits. Maybe we can work that. Maybe we can change that. Let's toss out some ideas so we can all walk away happy. So these spirits are, um, when they were originally conjured up, are they, are they spirits of people? Like, what are they exactly? Uh, the cast that would act as pilots, I had them as being like, they're literally dead people. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. risen. And then, you know, like, they're like, oh, well, I'm going to be a pilot, I guess, or something like that. Yeah. Cause they, their spirits couldn't leave this area because of the exactly. barrier. So it was yeah. like, but well, they were exactly. people yeah. is what we're yeah. saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. As opposed to like, they weren't folklore animals. Cause that was one Correct. direction we were going. Okay. Yeah. I think the, what's underneath the Mecca clockwork armor. Those are the folklore animals. Those right. Are the folklore animals. Exactly. And these spirit pilots are, are people. Correct. And how many of them are there? Of the animals or the people? Those people. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, that's a great question. How, what do you, what, why is that important to you? Um, because it affects like the whole economy of this land. Like if 50% of the people are spirits, that's a very different story than there's like 10 ghost pilots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. I guess even if there's a lot, it doesn't necessarily mean that like all of them have stuck to human civilization. Like mm -hmm. in my mind at the edges of the barrier, there's probably a lot that are trying to get out because they don't oh, yeah. really want to be stuck here. So they like, they kind of don't want anything to do with civilization anymore. So, well, I mean... Like, what I was talking about before with that, now that the barrier is broken, there's probably a significantly diminished population. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we're down to, um, you know, just a few thousand out, out mm -hmm. of the population or something like that, where there are enough to be important, but, you know, dwindling to the point where they're losing their relevancy to begin with. Mm -hmm. So there's a thousand ghosts that live in the city. Um, some of them are warriors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I just don't buy it. <laughs> like, I don't. I don't see how you construct a city with like half ghosts wandering around. Like what? What? How well, they're not happen? half like, ghosts. I, I mean, they're just full they're ghosts. literal ghosts. Yeah. Like, and what's the stakes there? Like, how do they get harmed? Like, they're insubstantial. I know, mean, like, we have magic, right? That's where. Mm -hmm. That's where that comes in. So then, the the oppositional force is is nature based. So are their weapons all like spiritual weapons now? Like swords that's, don't matter. Guns don't matter. The well, I mean, that's kind of matter. what we assumed, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just think, I think it creates way more problems than it solves. Hmm. Okay. So, so like I said, like, let's, let's change some things so we can make sure that everyone's happy. We have like a cool, cause this is the thing. We got to chase the fun. We got to chase the interesting bit. We got to find it and be like, fuck yeah, let's go. So let's do that. Let's find that interesting bit and run with it. Why don't we do this? Why don't we recap a little bit and make sure that our tenets all kind of jibe and then we can re that we can tweak some stuff. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So, uh, Courtney, your first tenet was? Uh, mine was that the kind of isolationism period that precedes this restoration was literal, that there was a an actual barrier a surrounding. Yeah, which we established was the spiritual barrier spiritual that's barrier. Holding, holding the spirits in. Yeah. Right. Uh, my first tenant was I wanted the class of people who were the pilots of these Mecca to be the samurai class that were being de-emphasized. In other words, these uh, Mecca animals were being decommissioned and being de-emphasized in the empire. Mm -hmm. 
And then Courtney jumped in with her tenet, which was... Yeah. My second one was that the um, pagodas on the backs of the Mecca animals are home to spirits that pilot and like give power to the animals. Right. Okay. And I think that that's the tenet that we're getting caught, caught up, up on. on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that the interesting, the interesting thing to me and the thing that I'm really interested in is focusing our attention on the class that is being decommissioned because that to me is the is the story that i'm interested in like i i would be okay for example with there being 10 ghost pilots right who have particular properties and we can explore like how they have a physiology what i find stretching the suspension of disbelief too far is there being thousands of people living alongside the rest of the society who are also mm -hmm. ghosts that somehow factor into it. Like, it mm -hmm. seems like there's just too much at once you add that. That's my problem. See, that's, that's so interesting to me because it's like that, that like you, we have giant mecha animals, but <laughs> ghosts are too much to you somehow. Like that's, that's well, so wild. It's because when you have like an internal logic and a fantasy story, like eventually it can stretch the logic too far. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that that pushes it too far where it's like, okay, now I've got to answer all these questions about how, a spiritual class of people interact and that that should also thematically have a lot to do with how the setting set up but we've got all this other stuff to grapple with mm -hmm. and i feel like it pushes it so far whereas if you restricted it to just the pilots these are the ones who were brought back they're the ones bound there's a generation of them or whatever that i could deal with and you can okay. tweak them to be vulnerable in a physical way too you know yeah i'm fine with just making them the pilots only and not dealing with any sort of civilian spirits mm -hmm. mm. okay so but but if we only have 10 then like what is or however many you know well right but let's say that there's even a hundred of them right like what is their purpose then except to be like window dressing on a setting mm -hmm. or if they're dwindling maybe they're they've dwindled down from some set of some number you know Right. So what's their importance then? Like, because again, I'm interested in watching their deterioration. Well, that's so, the story, right? If you were going to construct a story, I imagine you would pick a few of them and you maybe you'd have some human friends of theirs and tell their story, you know? Hmm. Mm. All right. I just don't know what, what is it as the setting to also have like the bakery down the street is, is owned by ghosts. And <laughs> that's you know, like, charming as fuck to me. But I that's a different that is, story yeah. is what I'm saying. Like that could be a slice of life story that focuses about on people living alongside ghosts. Whereas this story seems to be about a restoration of a civilization, the loss of the loss of this technology um, and these people who have to they, they've lost their function in society. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like they're two totally different stories in my head. Right. And I think that's where we're that's kind of where we're clashing here, Daniel. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Like when, and when let's focus on restoration as well, because I think you're taking restoration more literally than I am. Um, when you think of restoration, you think of like a, a re glorification of like a, like you're basically going into a new golden age, right? Is that what you're thinking? No, not based okay. on what I've read in that summary. Right. <laughs> it seems right, right. like a, a kind of a rallying <laughs> and, a re and a restoring of, of a, at least a previous idea of, of empire. Right. It, it's it's a cultural shift is mm -hmm. the, what the restoration represents to me. Right. And I don't see like why that can't jibe with what we have going on here. Right. I mean, we're doing a restoration, but that has nothing to do with a, a, a culture of half ghost people. <laughs> like, Well, I mean, that's, that's like the, the latest thing we've added on to the concept is what I mean. What do you mean? That's like the most recent thing we've added on to the concept is that half the a, po a large population of these people are ghosts. Right. Well, that's what the spiritual barrier is about. Mm -hmm. Well, originally, as we started talking about it, the spiritual barrier was supposed to keep in a certain number of spirits that power these pagodas. That's how I was understanding it the whole way through. I think mm -hmm. we had kind of established that it was because something on the outside was using them in a certain way or basically letting them out would have been a threat in itself. Mm. Right. Okay. How do we reconcile this? I mean, if we have a lot of spirits running around, like, do we need to focus on their day to day life? Could we just focus on the very important pilot class? Well, I mean, 
What do they do? Like, why are so, they wandering around then? <laughs> That's what so no, this, is, this is kind of this is kind of like the dilemma that I find myself in. Right? Is that if there is ten pilots left, then what is their cultural significance at that point? Right. Like they, they, it seems to me that that's not the emphasis anymore and that we're focusing on stuff that's entirely separate from them. You can make it entirely their focus. Like if you set up a story where um, the, the crust of the conflict is someone needs to get these machines working again because otherwise we're screwed. They may be the only ones who mm. can do that and you have to go find them because they've exiled themselves from society since their mm. caste has been shattered. Like then right, the story but I, becomes all about them. I, I suppose. I, I suppose I'm just having trouble because a cast of ten people is not a cast. It's just ten. Exactly. People. It's been broken to nothing. Yeah. Right. So, but so so there is our conflict that you and I are having is that I am interested in having that cast, and you're less mm-hmm. interested in having that cast. That's I what like I the hear. cast. I just think if the cast becomes all insubstantial ghost people, that's where I think the suspension of this blue gets stretched too far. Like maybe they have become ghost-like now and they weren't in the past. That mm. might make more sense. Like okay. as their cast broke down, their physicality broke down and now the remaining okay. people are you ghostly. You know what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think I think I can jibe this. Mm-hmm. So instead of Courtney, are you okay instead of them being just ghost people, are you okay with them just being able to channel a bunch of ghosts? Uh sure. Daniel, does that work yeah, for you? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like they're a, a priest. So, kind of yeah. Thing. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So this cast of people are like channelers. They're able yeah. to mm-hmm. like possess several spirits at once in order to fuel the Mecca. Does that work? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, yeah. they can, by that means they could become insubstantial and inhabit the machines too. While also maintaining mm-hmm. a physical form in reality. Yes. Right. That's all okay. I'm looking yeah. for is give them hey. some substantiality. <laughs> oh my God, Daniel, yeah. we did it. Courtney, we did it. Yay. Uh. <laughs> I was going to suggest that, but I felt like it would totally contradict your concept of them being insubstantial. <laughs> so. Right. Well, I, I see that was Courtney's um, kind of mm-hmm. tenet. And that, like, I didn't want to touch that either. So what's funny is that, like, in trying to, like, be respectful, we're both, like, butting heads about it. And, and as soon as you brought up the answer, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, fuck <laughs> it, right? Who cares? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so, yeah. That, just, that makes it believable to me, like, the cast. Right. Mm-hmm. We can treat them the same as anyone else living in this culture other than their cultural practices in terms of physical, in terms of physics, I mean, you know. Right. And now and now there is actually. Yeah. OK, this is this is suddenly a lot more interesting. Yeah. Me. OK, so then maybe cool. the barrier was in part to protect from the outside or keep stuff from leaving, but also to keep as many spirits in as possible to give those priests as much energy source mm-hmm. as they needed to do what they oh. need to do. Yeah, they needed sense. fuel. And the yeah. only way to fuel it is to like keep the barrier up. Mm-hmm. OK, does that work? Yeah, that yeah. all makes sense. Because oh my god! Now you have a coherent <laughs> singular culture. Like I think, mm. you know. All right, I'm gonna shed a tear. Uh, guys, this honestly, this is kind of fun for me because, like, I know that, like, oftentimes, and Clark has uh, has mentioned this when he's on the podcast, is that sometimes we come into a setting. And all of our tenets tend to line up and we're like, oh, my God, this makes sense. This makes sense. And it sounds like we're pre-recorded that we fucking figure uh-huh. all this stuff out ahead of time. And like this is one of the rare times where we're like we have to get through the crime and we have to like come to an understanding together mm-hmm. and it's not clean. And like now we get to show how the sausage is made. And that's like, bam, we're there. We made it. We did it. Yeah. I like, get yeah. to show that it takes work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Another idea to kind of talk about the the emperor's power versus this priest class and how that yeah. might have shifted over time is what if originally the emperor was really the only one that could do the spirit channeling stuff? Oh. And mm. during this like war that opened up to others and now he's kind of trying to reconsolidate his power and uh, the Ooh. priest class does not want to give that power up. Yeah, that's oh, really interesting. interesting. Yeah. And that's why they're being like hunted down secretly by like the empire or the emperor's like uh, minions and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And and this way, it's like you actually don't even necessarily have to position the emperor as a villain in this case. It's purely a political move, right? Yeah, yeah. Like they're yeah. basically the priest class has served their purpose. Like the threat on the outside is no yeah. longer really an issue, so they don't need to exist mm-hmm. anymore. And he can just kind of consolidate them. 
Right. And maybe that maybe they have an inflated self of a uh, sense of importance. Yeah. So they both have valid arguments. They're both like, hey, you know, like we've got we we deserve to exist. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that work. I think that works quite well, actually. All right. So and then and now, now we have the now we have the conflict. Now we have like the the emperor or the emperor's loyalists and then again much like the meiji restoration but instead of samurai it's like spiritual channels mm-hmm. there we go okay that's cool. really cool mm-hmm. oh daniel yeah. did we go over your tenets we again? didn't even get that far yeah. Did we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. we kind of like stopped halfway and yeah went off. all right because well, we got to the crux of the issue and yeah. it was exactly. solved that that yeah. was yeah. why because it was one of your tenets yeah. that yeah. we had the crux and now and so so uh, just picture Daniel and I shaking hands like in the <laughs> Predator. Yeah, you know, the, like, the, the what do you call the arm thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yes, which we used to call beef queens. Beef right, queens. right. Unfortunately, it is no. Well, it still yeah. can be beef queens, but it's yeah. going to be something in else. spirit. You know, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Daniel, what, what are your tenets? <laughs> we, um, I, I actually we didn't. So what with the Emperor thing we got? The emperor's mechanical mm-hmm. at the heart of it. The other right. thing I had mentioned is um, the people themselves are adopting mechanical technology. Oh yeah. Oh right. You wanted like cyborgs, basically, right? But it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't have to be f- like cyberpunk. It could be that their culture now has like a lot of technology in it. It could be mm-hmm. as simple as that. You know. Yeah, okay. I mean, it could be the fact that like these mecha animals are being decommissioned, so people are trying to figure out more uses for that like armor stuff that yeah. they had on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there's maybe their cultures, the streets are flooded with this kind of, you know, there's lamp lights now and mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know, wait, can't yeah. we just decommission the animals and give them different uses? Like instead of like war bots, they're just like agriculture machines or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. yeah, that would be yeah. sad. Uh, would it be sad because they're <laughs> why is it sad well so i I'm, I'm imagining like the ghostly warrior guys like going to a rice field or something where this thing is working or whatever makes sense and c- talking to it and it speaks of its days when it saw battle and like uh, fought yeah. for the for the nation and now it's been mm. reduced to this you know okay uh, I, see. I like this because from the channeler's perspective, yes, this mm-hmm. is a noble beast that has been reduced to, uh, you know, like tilling fields, mm-hmm. right? However, to the, oh, people, the spirit's perspective, they yeah, might from the have appreciate being back to the land, it, right? Mm-hmm. And or like mm-hmm. actually being part of an empire that values its people and protects mm-hmm. its people, or, or like is you know like creating good in the world, right? You know, like I think that works just as well because. You know, like they're obvious. The spiritual channelers are obviously focused on war and combat, mm-hmm. but that's not mm-hmm. the entirety of the focus that we're going on here. And that works. I think that works remarkably mm-hmm. well. I can even see a story where the warrior has to persuade this creature to put the armor back on for some last cause, mm-hmm. and it doesn't want to because it finds itself finally connected to the land again and free. Right, and you know. and then yeah. the whole or there's an entire conflict about the literal soul of this mechanized animal, that kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That works. I mean, thematically it's appropriately like, yeah, that absolutely works a hundred percent. All right. Uh, By the way, can we go back to your emperor real quick? Oh yeah. I I would really appreciate it if, so so we said that it's in this giant forbidden palace. It is the Mm -hmm. palace, right? Mm -hmm. We've said this. Yeah. Yeah, To deal with his, his premise. Right, 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 right. Um, can we also have it so the emperor was forcibly put there by the spirit channelers? Oh, uh, so so it's like maybe the emperor ha- had actually passed on, but the spirit channelers found him and then brought him back, tore down the barrier even to like instill him into this forbidden palace. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Because yeah, yeah, we had talked about him being like part of the barrier. So when right. They- started dismantling that they stuck him in the palace again mm-hmm. and in doing so they almost like created their own enemy because now that yeah. he's back in this one place now he wants to consolidate his power again mm-hmm. exactly and and obviously it's like okay we we want to expand and see the world outside of the barrier again so in a mm-hmm. way they had to do something they yeah. but they're like okay what do we do with it what do we do with this massive spirit we can't just destroy it because they it has a deific 
importance in our culture, in our, in our country. So they're like, okay, we'll honor them by putting them in this palace. And so I, I don't know. I think that sounds pretty fucking cool to me. No, I like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We're, we're getting there. We're doing <laughs> it. You guys, we are doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. My final tenet was uh Kaiju. There are none. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like there. we've done a good job there. We haven't mentioned Kaiju at all, except for giant spirit animals. That doesn't count technically. Yeah. So I'm cool with that. We have done the recap. We've reconciled Daniel and I are friends again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and to be clear, like I, in any like creative session, I never yes. have frustration with my people, but more Agreed. like frustration with the idea, right? Like mm -hmm. trying to, to string the tension out of it. And absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. And you've got to, I mean, and, and, and you, when everyone's working on it, we've got to, you've got to defend like your, um, not your concept, but defend the integrity of the whole thing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing a weakness, you got to keep attacking it until it reveals its strength underneath, you know, and someone will come up with that if you keep pushing them. You know? Yeah. Definitely. Right. Which Rob came up with something eventually once mm -hmm. we kept pushing. You know? mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think this is part of the reason why Daniel and I work as well together as we do. Mm -hmm. And Courtney as well is that we are never afraid to argue with one another and we are right. never afraid to like disagree because mm -hmm. we both know that we're, we have the best interest of the setting in mind. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta trust your, your partners. I exactly. Like. Exactly. Right. And, and um, I can, I can say this for everyone. I feel like, we all trust each other on a very important and deep basis. And the, the thing I would say too, is sometimes like, and this I feel like happens, which I'm sure you can speak to like in, in role playing sometimes as a GM, right? Like you don't even know the answer. You don't know the answer. You know that there is a good answer, but you don't got it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so you got to probe the other players to see if they can yield it. And so in this case, like I felt like, okay, I'm missing something here. It doesn't make sense. Hopefully they can come up with it, even though I'm all I'm doing is is saying no, right? <laughs> but eventually the no-ness gets some other answer out, you know. Right. From everyone else. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh we're we're basically wrapping up here. And I just want to say that I'm very grateful that we didn't end up with furry foxes. Um, <laughs> I am yeah, I, I think the uh, the priest class is a much more satisfying uh, uh -huh. conclusion to that. Dilemma. I, I yeah. agree. Diplo Raptor, I'm sorry you didn't get furry foxes in this one, but um, yeah. it's just not just just not this time. Just mm -hmm. not this time. Mm -hmm. All right. And finally, uh, with with all of the recap out of the way, the reconciliation is done. We can now roll for the twist and see what we're going to be getting into next time. Our twist for next time is. Now, family gets involved hmm. so families involved oh boy there's a bunch of different ways we can reconcile with that but uh we're gonna do that next time <laughs> a big thank you again to diplo raptor for submitting this prompt and remember that if you want us to build your world you can always go to our website worldbuildwithus.com click on the link follow the instructions and within a reasonable amount of time we'll be building your world if you want to follow us on social media, go to at Let's World Build on Twitter. If you want to come join our Discord and talk about how I got the Meiji restoration wrong, go ahead and click the link in the description and follow that instruction. And of course, if you're feeling particularly generous, you can always go to our Patreon. Give us money where you'll get access to sweet, sweet patron-only episodes. You'll get access to our private discord room uh you'll get episodes early what up i mean am i forgetting anything i'm sure that i'm forgetting stuff but anyway that's that's gonna do it for this episode of world build with us remember that we love you very much and we're gonna get through this together until next week 